Lloydminster utility rates will be increasing by 4% in the new year after City Council passed a new bylaw this week. Water, sewage and garbage collection are all part of the utility rate bylaw. The waste removal fee will go up by 86 cents a month in 2022, while the stormwater and water rate increase depends on usage and property size. There is going to be increased costs in wastewater treatment. Um, we're doing work at the water treatment plant, that's a capital work, but we're trying to look for cost savings where we can, but the, they are hard because the chemicals to bring the quality of water that we drink each and every day, which is very good, does cost money. The city has cited many reasons for the increase, including the cost of transition to the new wastewater treatment plant, higher chemical costs, and the carbon tax. That carbon tax affects us in many different ways. It affects the city at every operational level, basically, from the heat of this building to running the wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment plant, the water treatment plant, for electricity to pump the water up from the river. So every facet of our utility bill is touched by the carbon tax. The new rates come into effect on January 1st. Tomorrow is the annual Jail and Bail event for the Lloydminster and District SPCA, which helps fund raise towards the animal adoptions. The SPCA is already seeing lots of support for the event and hope to reach their goal for donations. This year's fundraiser will have the same precautions as last year due to the pandemic. Kind of like last year, we kept it a little bit lower on our JLEs, but obviously people that are still going to be, you know, you know, pushing that post for us and this and that, getting us attention. And then, you know, we really focused a little bit more on the silent auction again this year too, just because we can't have our jailers inside again this year. Hopefully it's different next year, but yes. The last Jail and Bail event had around 20 items for the silent auction portion, but this year the SPCA received over 50 items. They also previously surpassed their target goal of $10,000 by raising up to $11,000. Now for this year's Jail and Bill, the hopeful goal is set for $20,000. We have noticed our donations have gone down, but again, like last year, you know, we, we really noticed our community pull through for us. And, you know, I think they will again this year. You know, anytime that we have thrown anything out there about our injured animals that have come in, you know, we've had lots and lots of donations come in for that. So our community still really is, you know, stepping up into helping to take care of us still. You can find more information on the jailies you'd like to bail out of jail on the Lloydminster and District SPCA's website. The silent auction can be easily accessed through their Facebook page tomorrow between 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can even bail out our own Shelby Clark who will be participating in tomorrow's event. As we move closer to the holidays, schools around the border city are getting into the Christmas spirit. And in this week's Beyond the Classroom, we take a look at the Lloydminster Catholic School Division's Christmas Drive-In Concerts. <laughs> Students and staff across the division planned out costumes, songs, dances, and more in preparation for this year's concerts. Last year, LCSD decided to do a drive-in concert to be more COVID-friendly and continued that idea again. We had a lot of help. We had... Um, some technical support from Jesse Mann and Kim Capral that really pulled things together, but, and staff writing Christmas concerts, students doing singing, dancing, poems, narrating. It's just been a wonderful celebration of Christmas and what it means to us here. This year's event had eight concerts from all five elementary schools in the division. Over 800 cars attended the event, and families were able to watch the videos at home as well. LCSD staff was glad to see it was a big hit again this year. There were big snowflakes some of the nights and it was nice to see that parents didn't let snow stop them. They came out and saw um, Maz Entertainment has such a large screen with bright beautiful color everyone was able to see out there but also all the families that have messaged that they've been able to watch and share and experience it at home as well. With the success of the drive-in concert the past two years, the division isn't quite sure if they will go back to their standard Christmas concerts when the holiday season rolls around next year. I think COVID uh, created an opportunity for some creativity in our approach to this, and it will definitely be interesting going forward on where we would be with performing arts. So there's some real benefits to this approach, but there's also that idea of what we also get from being there live which will maybe be some combination in the future. <laughs> and that's it for this week's Beyond the Classroom.
At Lakeland College, our students are challenged to go beyond the classroom, so when industry knocks, they're ready to thrive. Learn more at lakelandcollege.ca. If you haven't had the chance to get your wish list into the big man himself, you might want to sharpen your skates. With more, here's Tate Laycraft. Joining me right now on Primetime Local News is Gracie Lillian Scold from Lloyd Minster's Youth Council, and she's here to talk about their upcoming Santa Skate. So, um, Gracie, thanks so much for being here, but what can you tell people about this upcoming event? So, the Lloyd Minster Youth Council puts on different kinds of events for people of all ages. We recently had a Border Idol event at the end of November with the new Lloyd Minster Nissan which was a major success. And so we were looking to host something close to Christmas time. So we decided that a uh, Santa skate would be a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the council is allotting two different time periods for different age groups. One is for families and the other is for teens. Yeah, so for the family skate, anyone is welcome to come. That's from two to four on Sunday, December 19th. And then the teen skate is from 7.30 till 9 that day, and it's for grades 9 to 12. Mm, um, and the Youth Council has actually teamed up with a couple of sponsors to help make this skate possible. So would you mind just touching base uh, on them? Yeah, so we are so grateful for all our sponsors. So we have the Tim Hortons, their Power Center, Randall Center, and Iron Wells locations. They're supporting us, and they're giving free coffee and hot chocolate. And then Walk on Water and Art Soul Life Creative Studio are also helping us with some of our prizes. Mm, um, and just before we close, for any families who might be interested in learning more about the Santa Skate, where's a good spot for them to go online? Um, so everything is on our Facebook and Instagram pages. And then, yeah, most of your information you should be able to find on there. Thanks so much, Gracie. Now Shelby Clark will take a first look at your Wednesday weather. Thanks so much Jasmine. Now taking a first look at your weather forecast for here in the border city. We have cooled down quite a bit. We are sitting at minus 24 with that wind chill. It does feel like minus 34. So if you are outside, make sure you are bundling up so you can try and stay warm out there. But we did see a little bit more sun peak behind those clouds throughout the day there. So hopefully we will be uh, warming up later on into next week, but doesn't seem likely. Now switching over to temperatures across the region for Alberta and Saskatchewan on the Alberta side, we are cooling down quite a bit. Uh, most spots are at minus 22 degrees, minus 21 up in Lac La Biche, while Edmonton is sitting at minus 18. Minus 23 in St. Paul and Vagreville, while there's minus 21 in Provost down there as well. Switching over to the Saskatchewan side here, they're seeing uh, around the same as what we are seeing on the Alberta side. Uh, most are seeing uh, that minus 20, minus 21 mark in most spots. Minus 22 in Meadow Lake, while Maidstone is the coolest at minus 24 degrees. Macklin, down in Macklin is at minus 19. And North Battleford is at minus 21 as well. And for North Battleford overnight tonight, they will be going down to a low of minus 29. So they will be cooling down quite a bit. So make sure you are plugging in your vehicles, as I was saying before, because we are going to be seeing some very low lows for our evenings. Uh, tomorrow, they will be seeing minus 24 for their uh, daily highs. So they will be uh, seeing some cooler temperatures for tomorrow. So you over to Cold Lake, we'll be going down to a low of uh, minus 30. So they will be cooling down quite a bit as well. Tomorrow, they will be warming up just slightly to minus 19, but they will be seeing around a 60% chance of some flurries tomorrow. Switching over to Border City here, we are going to be going down to a low of minus 29, but with that wind chill, it will feel close to minus 40. So make sure you are bundling up. If you are going outside at all, try and stay warm. Uh, make sure you're plugging in your vehicles, all that. And tomorrow, it will be minus 21 for us, but we will be seeing a high chance of some flurries there as well. And now switching over to our three-day forecast for here in the Border City. As I was saying, we will be cooling down quite a bit uh, throughout this week. Uh, we'll be minus 21 tomorrow for Thursday with a low of minus 29. Friday starting off this weekend, we will be starting off a lot cooler compared to what we've been seeing before. We'll be seeing minus 23 degrees on Friday with the same low there. And Saturday for our weekend, we will be seeing minus 18 with a low of minus 31. So if you still need to get some holiday shopping done, just be careful out there on those roads if need so. That is the first look at your weather forecast. We'll have more coming up after the break.
Welcome back. The 2022 winner of Miss Rodeo Canada is a woman from central Alberta who credits her involvement in 4-H in agriculture and helping her nab the title. Jillian Code has more. Today on Primetime Local News, I'm joined by Jaden Calvert, who was recently crowned Miss Rodeo Canada 2022. So Jaden, can you tell me what prompted your interest in this competition? Well, I've always wanted to be a rodeo queen. My mom was a rodeo queen. My aunt ran for Miss Rodeo Canada. And a lot of the other women that I looked up to growing up were all involved in rodeo queen competitions. So there was definitely no question when I became old enough to start running for rodeo queen titles that that's definitely what I was going to do. And of course, my background in 4-H and agriculture and showing horses and showing cattle really helped me become the woman I am today and gave me all of the skills that I would need to excel in these rodeo queen competitions. So I was just very excited when they announced that they were going to be having a Miss Rodeo Canada 2022 competition so that I could run and take the Miss Rodeo Sundry title that I previously had to that competition. And what was the selection process like? So like I mentioned before, to run for Miss Rodeo Canada, you have to already hold a professional rodeo queen title for a different Canadian professional rodeo. So I took Miss Rodeo Sundry. And at the competition, we compete in a variety of different little contests. There's public speaking where we have to deliver a prepared speech as well as some impromptu speeches. We have a personal interview where we get some one-on-one -on -one time with the judges. There's a horsemanship competition, which involves riding a bunch of different horses that we have never ridden before and doing patterns on them, as well as some rail work. And we do that because when you're Miss Rodeo Canada, you go to rodeos all over North America and you get to ride horses that are just supplied for you. So you just have to hop on and be able to handle any situation that you get put in with a strange horse. And we also compete in a written exam, which tests our rodeo knowledge as well as equine knowledge and sometimes some current events to make sure that whoever wins the title of Miss Rodeo Canada is very knowledgeable in all of those areas. And then there's a fashion show, which is kind of the fun portion of the competition and we're judged a little bit on our modeling. <laughs> So it's a big mix of everything that, that you guys get judged on. And now I'm wondering with your title, uh, what responsibilities does that entail? Well, of course you can expect to find me at all sorts of rodeos across Canada and across North America in the upcoming year. But besides rodeos, I also get to attend a lot of community events, charity events, different things that may be inside or outside of the Western way of life. So you can expect to see me at a wide variety of different places. And yeah, basically events can just book Miss Rodeo Canada through our website and then I can show up and, and do absolutely anything at any event. And, and you mentioned earlier that both uh, your mom and your aunt have been involved with Miss Rodeo Canada. So for you to win the title this year, what does it mean to come you know, full circle? Uh, it was an unreal moment, that's for sure. Something I'll never forget. I competed with two other lovely ladies who were just as deserving as this title as I am and brought a lot to the table. So to be the one who was successful and is wearing this crown right now just meant so much. And yes, typically Miss Rodeo Canada goes through a bit of a lady in waiting period as the subsequent queen sort of finishes up her year. And then I get to dive into going to events in 2022 but with Alicia still being at the NFR last weekend I got to attend my very first event which was a stuff of a stuff a bus event in Cochrane and that was actually with the Cochrane and area event society which was sort of organized and spearheaded by my uncle who had passed away a couple of years ago so it meant a lot to be able to attend that event as Miss Rodeo Canada and I was so happy to be invited and it was just a great way to start my year. Jaden congratulations once again and thank you for joining me today. Thank you Jillian. A number of local hockey teams are supporting a local charity. Evan Kenny has more with the founder. 
I'm pleased to be joined now by Olivia Brockoff, the founder of Project PJ by Olivia. Olivia, thank you so much for taking this time and joining us. Just tell us a little bit about this initiative. Yeah, for sure. So this is my seventh year doing it. And um, when I was little, my she was my best friend. Her little sister had cancer and was constantly in and out of the hospital. And like, I saw that and was surrounded by that all the time. And like that, that's really hard because she was in kindergarten, like just a baby still. And so I was like, I can't cure cancer, but I want to be able to help people in and in some any in some way like what is the way I can help people and so I kind of just sat in the car because I was in the car with my mom and I was like oh what can I do and then I thought one thing we could do is I could collect and donate PJs to go to the Stollery Children's Hospital the Alberta Children's Hospital and the hospital here in Lloyd. And Olivia, last weekend and this upcoming weekend, the Lloydminster Inland Steel Bobcats have been collecting donations at their games. Just tell us a little bit about what this community support has meant to yourself. Yeah, it's been insane because the hockey community has been helping me for years. And like, I feel such love and warmth from them. And every year, they help out it just gets bigger and bigger and more hockey teams are like I'm in like let's do it and last year it was hard because of COVID there was no hockey so we didn't have that hockey community helping out which I really missed because it also becomes a community to me like I meet people I get to hang out with the players a few years ago I went with this uh, PWM Steelers to Calgary for a hockey tournament and I got to hang out with both bunch of hockey teams there and see like the family aspect of teams and it's just it's really great that there's this massive community that wants to help me and can help me it really makes my heart full and warm and Olivia you mentioned it obviously you know there in Calgary uh, the Southside Athletic Club from Edmonton and the Sherwood Park Kings uh, have joined in with the Inland Steel Bobcats so obviously you know it's spreading around What's it mean that not just our community is supporting, but communities elsewhere as well? Yeah, it's crazy. Like, um, so this year, it has been insane. Like, I've just found out through Instagram who's participating. Like, people will tag me and they're like, we're in. Like, we're doing this. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay, like, that's awesome. Like, there are so many people. It's really hard for me to keep track of, especially when, like, places that, people who don't live here are like, oh, we're going to help this girl we don't even know. Or this is not a part of our community and we're going to do these challenges and we're going to collect these PJs. It's really crazy to me how much it spreads through the hockey community and how places like Calgary and the Inland Bobcats, like that's just, that blows my mind that those people want to help. Finally, Olivia, if people do want to donate, how can they go about that? Um, you can contact us at Project PJ by Olivia on Facebook and Instagram, and we can figure it out from there. If you're not from here and you want to donate PJs, we can get in contact. We do have drop-off locations, Carter's Oshkosh and Bagosh, uh, Wayside Dental Center, and then Hot Peppers, and then through the hockey games here in Lloyd, uh, they are taking donations as well. Thank you so much for taking this time and joining us, Olivia. This was Olivia Brockhoff, uh, founder of Project PJ by Olivia. For anybody who does want to donate, uh, the Inland Steel Bobcats will be playing their next game on Saturday, 2 p.m. at the Centennial Civic Center. Now Shelby Clark will take a look at the cold temperatures around the region. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Now taking another look at your weather forecast. We're going to be starting off with the central region of Alberta and Saskatchewan here. On the Alberta side, we are cooling down quite a bit with minus 21 in Athabasca and Rocky Mountain House. Minus 20 in Edmonton, while Jasper is looking the warmest at minus 12 degrees. And it is minus 19 in Edson and White Court is sitting at minus 20 now as well. Switching over to the Saskatchewan side here, Cold Lake is looking a lot cooler. Like here in the Border City, they're sitting at minus 24 degrees. Minus 23 in Meadow Lake, while it is minus 20 in Prince Albert and Melford 
Saskatoon is sitting at minus 21 and North Balfour is at minus 22 degrees. So we are seeing a lot of those minus 20 temperatures now as we are heading more into the winter season. And switching over to our northern region of the provinces, they are seeing some cooler temperatures as well, of course. Uh, minus 18 in South End and Stony Rapids. Uranium City is seeing the coolest at minus 26. Minus 23 in Lalosh and Buffalo Narrows, while Orange is at minus 20 and uh, Flin Flon is at minus 16 degrees, while Wollaston Lake is at minus 19. Switching over to this end here, they are seeing uh, some slightly cooler temps compared to the Saskatchewan side. Uh, it is minus 21 in Slave Lake, while it is minus 24 in both Peace River and Grand Perry. Minus 26 in Fort McMurray, while high level in Fort Chippewa at minus 27, minus 28. Switching over to our southern region, they are seeing some cooler temperatures as well, but not as cool as what we are seeing in the central and the northern region, of course. Uh, it is minus 14 in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, while Calgary is sitting at minus 16. Banff is the warmest, seeing minus 10 at the moment, and Coronation is the coolest at minus 22. Switching over to this side here, they're seeing some slightly cooler temps. As you can see, uh, some have reached past those minus 20 points with uh, Swift Current and Kindersley are past them. Uh, minus 15 in Yorkton, while Estevan is at minus 16, and the rest are sitting at minus 18 degrees. But as we go pa uh, back across the region of temperatures overnight tonight, we, we do have an extreme cold warning right now in effect for most spots across the region here. As you can see, we're cooling down for tonight quite a bit, so make sure you are trying to stay warm out there. It is minus 29 in most spots on the map here, as you can see. Pearsland and Myr Myrna will be seeing a low of minus 30 degrees. Bonneville will be seeing a lot cooler with a minus 31, and Isla Cross will be seeing a low of minus 26. So make sure you are plugging in those vehicles uh, throughout the night tonight. And for here in the border city with our seven-day forecast, Thursday we'll be seeing minus 21 with a 50% chance of some flurries, so get ready to see some more snowfall. Friday will start off this weekend a lot cooler with minus 23 and seeing minus 18, minus 14 for our weekend, ending off with a high chance of some flurries to end off the weekend as well. And starting off next week, we'll be having that cold streak continue on with minus 19 on Monday. Tuesday seeing minus 20 with a 60% chance of some flurries as well. And Wednesday seeing a little bit more sun there. Now I just want to show off some of the photo submissions we got. Thank you to everyone that submitted some nice photos online. Thank you to uh, Gregory here with a beautiful shot and it looks like it's like perfectly um, shoveled out there. So thank you for being able to post this, post this online. You can submit some more weather photos and I will use them on my weather segments. That's all I got for now. We'll have more coming up after the break. Stephanie Dobson is back with us this week. Stephanie is a lawyer and mediator at Hanka Divorce Law and Mediation here in Lloydminster. And we are back for the last episode of the year of Healthy Thriving Family After Divorce. And Stephanie, we've been going through this now for a few weeks, talking about the holidays and going through divorce and separation, a number of different subjects. So today we're going to be talking about blended families and the holidays. So Stephanie, what's the definition of a blended family? Sure. Well, I thought that we could start out just by um, talking about what that really means. Uh, so uh, a blended family is really a household that's made up of two people who are in a relationship. So two partners in a relationship who have really brought in children from the outside of the relationship, or they could even have new children of their existing relationship. So another word for it might be a step family, or of course, the term that ABC uh, made famous, the term modern family. Now, when it comes to traditions, obviously it's, it could be different, especially if they are uh, over, you know, you have two different people coming in. And so uh, what do you recommend as far as old traditions versus new traditions? Well, I, our viewers might remember we talked a lot about traditions, old versus new, in parts two and parts three. But as a first step, when your children go from being a one-household family to a two-household family, there may have been some traditions that got carried over. Or you may have created some new traditions at that time. So when you're looking at now a blended family, you may want to have a re-look at that and think about what traditions get kept and what new ones are created. So the first thing I recommend is to sit down with your partner and their kids and of course your kids and, and you and um, all of you to really to hear each other, to hear what your experiences have been and what your traditions have been and then decide together as a family what that, what that might look like for you guys this year. Now it might be that 
you don't agree on what those traditions will look like. And some things might be special for one family, but not for the other. So don't forget that it doesn't have to be all family all the time. You can certainly pick and choose and, you know, do things with you and your biological children and then also do some things as a family. Well, let's talk about gift giving uh, in blended families. Stephanie, what would you recommend uh, some tips when it comes to gift giving? Well, we're almost at that time now. It's just a few days before Christmas, but definitely if you haven't um, planned all of your gifts yet, I recommend at the very least that you try to keep the gift giving as equitable as possible. So that's between whether that's uh, on, a, on a dollar level, whether that's on a number of gifts level, or even who's going to get which gifts, just to arrange that between you and your partner. So one of the things I recommend though, is don't forget if, if you do anything, any gifts that are sort of what I call family oriented, um, that have to do with um, the whole family, just make sure that every sibling is included. And let's talk about family gatherings, because obviously that could be, you know, especially for new blended families, maybe a little difficult. So uh, what do you recommend to make these gatherings go as smooth as they possibly can? <laughs> Isn't that always the goal? It, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of relationships there are. There's some, when you have an extended family gathering, there's going to be one household families where mom and dad are still together. There might be some blended families and even some single parent families. You know, every family has its own dynamic. So when we're considering uh, gatherings this year, of course, there's already the COVID related gathering restrictions, but what you might want to do is just think about what gatherings are going to bring your blended family the most joy and what is going to help to further that sense of family. You know, there's so many toxic relationships that can be had in, in families. It's really important to try to keep those toxic uh, relationships sort of out or sort of away from your blended family so that um, you can have um, the most joy that you can. And what about some tips, Stephanie, for families that are new to blending? <laughs> Excuse me. You know, it's it's really important in any time, not only the holidays, but really to give the whole family time to adjust. You know, if you and your partner can really keep your expectations in check, and I don't say have low expectations, I just mean keep them in check because that's going to allow the beauty of the holiday season to really shine through and to embrace the good times. Uh, when we look at then step siblings, of course, they also have a hard time um, trying to get used to one another. So you may want to have opportunities where there's separate family fun and then there's family fun as a whole, just so to give everyone a little bit of time and space. Well, and to wrap things up here, Stephanie, we do have a holiday giveaway that's happening. Uh, so let's talk about that. How can people yes. enter to get uh, the, the information that you have available for free? <coughs> So um, uh, at Up A Notch Learning, that's my e-learning platform, I've got a course called Healthy Thriving Families 101. And that course is designed for families who are just new to separating. And that course is a 90 minute online self-directed course. So you sign in, you take the course at your own pace. It's normally retailed at $97. And today we're giving, and for the holidays, we're giving away 10 free courses um, to 10 um, to 10 families. So if you're interested in that, you just have to email to our office and I think you're going to put it up on the screen, Stacy. The email address is info at henkadivorce.ca and just type in the keyword thrive and we'll send you out a promo code. All right, Stephanie. Well, it has been a pleasure speaking with you all through this year. Always something interesting to chat about with separation and divorce and we wish you a uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and we will speak to you again in the new year. Thanks. You too, Stacy. Joining me today from the Lloydminster Fishing Game is Dwayne Davidson to give me some tips on the upcoming ice fishing season. So Dwayne, uh, right now we've sort of seen a bit of different weather, a uh, couple cold weeks, other warm ones. Uh, is it safe to say that ice fishing has started or is the ice still not ready? I've heard a few people venturing out on the ice, uh, not so much on the big lakes, but around the edges there and uh, it's it's a little precarious to go out uh, this early in the year. I know I, I don't do it, but uh, 
Um, some people uh, walk out and uh, pull a sleigh and that type thing just to get around the edge of lakes. And, and again, the bigger lakes are the ones that are more risky just due to the bigger uh, water surface area. And like I said before, we've had pretty varying weather over the past few uh, months. How has that sort of affected the ice? Well, people people like the, the snow that are outdoorsy people, but uh, one of the problems with uh, too much snow early on in the season, it's not great for making ice. You have cold weather and not much snow, that, that's your best uh, ice making conditions because the snow itself actually acts as an insulating blanket and you don't get good uh, ice uh, making uh, conditions to get that ice nice and thick uh, so you can go out on it. Yeah, and then with the new people sort of taking up ice fishing, uh, what are some things that they should be watching out for just as they're starting to get into it? Well, basically you wanna go out and be sure of the ice. And, and I mean, you can get information from people who have gone out on, on various lakes. Uh, the ice fishing community is pretty broad. So get, uh, you know, get, get those, but al always use caution. Don't just uh, drive out there thinking everything's safe. Like one of the problems that people do overlook a lot of the times is wherever a river comes into a lake, you avoid those places because flowing water doesn't make good ice. And uh, you could go through the ice uh, where a creek or a river comes in and you could have four feet ice, 50 feet uh, away from where the water's actually flowing. So it's something you really gotta be aware of throughout the whole ice fishing season. And then with ice fishing and walking out onto the frozen lakes, what are some things sort of with the thickness of ice that people should be keeping in mind? Well, there you, you can go online and get uh, the various uh, thicknesses that are acceptable and that, but uh, you know, generally speaking, to walk on it, you want at least four inches, and then uh, anywhere from uh, sixteen to twenty inches for any lighter vehicles and that type of thing. And as you get heavier vehicles, well, obviously you need more ice. So I kind of I kind of like the eighteen inch uh, ice myself. But again, check the the you can check on the internet and get some uh, definite numbers there that you feel safe with. Yeah, and so with going out on to the frozen lakes, what are some things that people should be watching out for just from a safety perspective? Well, one thing you really got to watch for with ice fishing, if you're out there on a snowmobile, there's ice heaves out there and there's actually um, firm uh, from people uh, might have an ice shack, they might have a bigger hole so they could actually leave a block of ice there or just even the uh, frozen uh, heaps of snow when you drill there and uh, that can get fairly high and it freezes. And if you hit that with one ski, you can tip over quite easily. So you really got to pay attention when you're out there. And for, for most snowmobilers, they understand that uh, when it's a cloudy day, you don't have any shadows to give you any good uh, vision on what's coming up as you're driving towards something. On a sunny day, you can have a shot. You can have a shadow to give you a visual visualization that there is a mound there or whatever, but cloudy days, that's, uh, that's pretty risky when you're on a snowmobile. So you really got to pay attention. And you had mentioned the community around ice fishing is all pretty supportive. Is there anywhere online that people can go find uh, like ice conditions or where there's good fishing even? Well, I mean, uh, you can talk to the local outdoor shops and just local people and that. And and some some fishermen will give their hot spots away and some won't. It's just like anything else in the outdoors. There are some people are a little more competitive than others. And, you know, it, it, it all that information helps, but it really comes down to the person doing the fishing uh, and how they wiggle their worm, basically. And and that's very true that uh, there's better fishermen than others uh, through experience and that. But my hope is you you share as much knowledge as you can and let as many people enjoy the outdoors and ice fishing as, as possible. That's great. That's all the questions that I had. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, just that... Uh, get as many people out there uh, as you can and get the youth out there and get them fishing and get them used to it. A uh, nice sunny day out on the ice. It's a lot of fun for, for the kids and that, and you don't, you don't have to be old to do that. Uh, I actually uh, get my grandkids a fishing rod when they're three years old and get them started early. And uh, that's fishing out of a boat and, and ice fishing all at the same. So get them out there and let them enjoy the great outdoors much much better uh, outdoor screen than sitting and watching the screen in the house. Great, thank you for taking the time to meet with me.
We'll be ending off with taking another look at your seven-day forecast here. So expect to plug in your car tonight because it will be cooling right down. We'll be seeing minus 21 for Thursday with a high chance of some flurries. Friday will start off this week in a little bit cooler at minus 23. So make sure you're bundling up outside because it will be a lot cooler. Minus 18 and minus 14 for the weekend there to end it off. And starting off next week, we'll continue that uh, cold pattern with minus 19 on Monday. Seeing uh, around a 60% chance of some flurries on Tuesday at minus 20. And Wednesday, we'll see a little bit more sun there at minus Minus 16. Thank you for joining us on Primetime Local News, and you can watch the second hour on CITO.